part one of this series, we discussed the deep and rich history of the blues. Now it's time to learn about some of the early styles that emerged from the different regions of the southern states and some of the key players that brought them to us. It's time to talk about country blues and delta blues. Welcome to Music Student 101. Here are your hosts, Jeremy Burns and Matthew Scott Phillips. Okay, man, we're back. We are back. Welcome back to Music Student 101, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Matt, how are you today, sir? I'm doing all right. Yeah? Hanging in there. Hanging in there? Yeah, the new semester's in full swing, but... Uh, oh, is uh, it? We, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, so, uh, we're about two months in at this point, and got about uh, two, maybe three weeks till spring break, so... Hmm. Yeah. Very cool, very cool. You said you were feeling a little sluggish earlier? Oh, yeah, well, I'm just not moving fast today, and I don't I, I think I'm just tired, but, yeah. It's the off day. It's the. <laughs> it's been a long week, you know? Right, yep. Um, I don't know, man. I'm feeling kind of... I've kind of... I think I've got what I call the blues research blues. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to know. There's a lot to know, and this is a subject that I wasn't very well versed in, just because it, it, it has not always captivated me as a genre. Sure. Um, as a bassist, I say this again, <laughs> where is that, if I was a guitar player, I might be just like much more uh, captivated or yeah, playing blues licks all over the place, you know, <laughs> bass lines just boom, 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 boom. Yeah, except that it's not just that. No. <laughs> That's what I do every time. No exceptions. <laughs> no exceptions. Um, but, uh, hey, here's something kind of cool. Remember, remember last time? Oh, last time we talked about blues, blues part one, we kind of talked about the roots, you know? Right. Uh, and we talked about a lot of these uh, female v blues queens. Right. You know? Um, and they kind of took up most of the episode. Yeah. You know? And one of those was Bessie Smith. And right, yeah. I had mentioned that I saw that there was a Bessie Smith biopic on HBO. So a couple of nights ago, I decided to go ahead and watch this, uh, this biopic called Bessie. Oh, good. Starring Queen Lativa. Starring Queen Latifah. Yes. Yeah, and it was awesome. I mean, um, in the movie, and you know, you know, you know, you know, obviously they make movies with a little bit of spice. They throw a little spice in the portrayals, right? Yeah, a little creative uh, discretion. Yeah, but it did do a pretty good job of outlining the um, adversity in her life. Mm. You know, yeah, be it her relationships or be it a system oppressing her. And, right. Boy, she was a tough lady. Oh, she was. She didn't yeah. fool around, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was just a great movie. And, and, and I'd like to reflect a little bit on the fact that, like, um, it kind of showcased her, um, her, uh, her sexual liberation. Ah. Shall we say? Okay. Now, the man she was with was also getting some on the side, but apparently she was doing the same kind of thing. Yeah. But I, I was thinking about, like, you know, the time period they came from, not they're they're not distantly removed forefathers had no choice of where they could travel. Right, or sure. Yeah. Even their mates, they couldn't right. choose their they were right, yeah. kind of bred, I imagine. A little bit. Like like animals, you know. Yeah. The slave master would put these two together because they could probably make a stronger worker. Mm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So if you think if you think about them just getting out of that era, you can imagine that there are some who would like really kind of Yeah. Exercise the, those privileges. Imagine Freedoms. Feeling that close to a time when you would not have been a free person. Imagine being that close was where, you know, your great, your grandmother or maybe your great grandmother was someone who, who did not have the choices of personhood that, that, that you have, you know. Um, imagine how that feels. Yeah. You know? To hear the stories. Yeah. The first accounts, first hand right, accounts. Right, yeah, exactly, yeah. Because obviously Bessie was born after the Emancipation Proclamation. Right, yeah. But, um, yeah, again, it wasn't too long ago. Yeah. But anyways, I just thought that was a really cool cool picture and a, a very fascinating story. Absolutely. Worth, worth checking out. Absolutely. <clears throat> okay. Let's go ahead and get into some of these new reviews and so forth before we continue with the episode, shall okay. we? Okay, so we got a new review. Okay. From uh, We got five stars. Yay. From Tim T. 
T181. Okay. Out of the USA. Ah. Tim says, this is my first ever podcast. Wow. I'm 48 and took up the guitar and music theory about a year and a half ago. Nice. I went all in from there. Keyboard, bass, and even trumpet. Wow. I'm not good, but I try hard. <laughs> That's all relative. That's all of us. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was looking on the iTunes for an ear training download and stumbled across this. I almost didn't start at the beginning because I'm pretty far along on the theory stuff, but I'm glad I did. They explain several basic things differently than when I was looking at them. Huh. Great podcast. We'll be going through everything they have. Thanks, guys. Well, thank you, Tim. Always good to be helpful to, to shore up some of those things. Yeah, we do recommend that, that people start at the beginning, right? We Absolutely. still kind of recommend people start at the beginning. Even if you think, okay, this is simple stuff and, and I, already, I already know all this. Yeah, it, it never hurts to, to shore up some things, right? And, more and more people who have contacted me saying that they were well-versed in theory said that they went back from the, top, from the start and learn some things that they didn't learn or learn right. some different approaches. Right. Everyone yeah. has different approaches. Absolutely. And I'm still learning different approaches. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. But anyway, thanks again, Tim. And uh, thanks for the reviews. It helps to boost our presence and so forth and so on. Absolutely. And we also have a new Patreon uh, patron. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. Uh, if you would like to support us on Patreon, you can. Uh, Patreon.com slash musicstudent101. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get access to free stuff. Uh, remind me of the levels there, Jeremy. Well, you got your uh, your unison level, which is basically that just get for a dollar or two a month can get you into the site where you can check out all the videos and all the extra episodes. Right. Yep. And then you have our per our major thirds. Right. Who get the coffee mug? Who get the music one hundred and one coffee mug. Which I maybe have about 12 or so of those left, so we might have to either get more <laughs> or figure out so, another thing. It might be if I find something lighter, it might cost less to ship. Right. We'll see. We'll get a 16-ounce coffee mug. <laughs> <laughs> Good plan. But, um, <clears throat> but either way, no, that's, it's, it's, we appreciate your donations, and a little goes a long way. Absolutely. And then the perfect fifth level. We will actually get you the coffee mug, and we will do an episode, a mini episode for you based on any question at all. Yeah, for Patreons only, you get to ask us a question, and we will attempt to answer it in a uh, mini episode. Yeah. If it has to do with music, we'll likely give you a better answer. <laughs> like, and, more likely than you a, give us, a, we'll give you a better answer. And a longer answer. <laughs> but let's, uh, let's talk to, let's see what Fanny Coppins has to say. Right, so Fanny Coppins from Brussels, Belgium, mm -hmm. says, I'm glad to be part of such a nice, supportive community. I've already learned a lot with your podcast, and I'm excited every time I see a new one popping up in my app. Oh, mm -hmm. thank you, mm -hmm. Fanny. I had started to learn the violin in September 2017 in a folk music class where everything is done by ear and from memory and without formal music theory training. As I was reading up on the basic theory concepts on Wikipedia and such, and my interest for the subject grew, I figured it would be good if I could learn more during my podcast listening commutes and runs. And now I am almost exclusively listening to classical music-related podcasts. <laughs> yeah, that'll happen. <laughs> theory, analysis of classical music, life in the orchestra, etc. Uh, and since last September... In addition to the folk classes, I'm also attending my local music school for classical violin, yay, mm -hmm. and theory lessons. I also have some ukuleles and recorders at home, which I try to learn to play with the help of YouTube videos and children beginner's books. Warm regards, Fanny. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for your kind words, Fanny, and for your support. We really do appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I think it's cool that she's taking folk violin lessons. yes. And I wonder, when I think folk violin, violin lessons, and I haven't heard back yet, but I was telling yep. her, when I have, think folk violin, I think fiddle. I think right. country music. I think yeah. Appalachian. I think uh, jigs, reels of the Celtic persuasion. Yeah. I wonder if being in Belgium, she has a different idea of folk violin that probably has more to do with, with Belgian folk music, with European folk music. This is what I'm most intrigued in. So, Fanny, hit me back and let us know. We're very curious. Absolutely. And if you have any recordings, we'd love to hear them. Absolutely. All right. So thanks again, Fanny, and um, we'll hopefully stay in touch, right? Mm. And uh, thanks for joining us on Patreon. Okay. Now we have ourselves the listener mail. We have a new listener named Paul Figali of Fort Worth, Texas. Paul says... 
Thanks for the amazing podcast. It is exactly what I hoped for when I set out to find a podcast I could listen to at work, which would help me compose for piano better at home. Oh, nice. That's kind of cool that you're thinking about that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Off on the clock, I guess on we the clock. say. <laughs> we won't tell you, boss. Right. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> If God allows, I will someday send y'all some composition using techniques I learned from y'all. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yeah, everybody does. I hope everybody does that. Yeah, like, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> learning about the circle of fifths was a big leap for me. It is for everyone. And that's not the first time I've heard that. Sure. That's a, that's a crucial step forward in your knowledge when you understand the circle of fifths. Now, here's the most important part. <laughs> I could say many flattering yet true things about both of y'all, <laughs> but I'll stick to these. Matt, your love for your craft is refreshing, and Jeremy, you are eminently likable individual. I agree. Jeremy uh, is an eminently likable individual. I ain't shoot for likable, <laughs> but I wasn't shooting for eminently. That's really that's, that's, <laughs> eminently that's likable. Bonus. Yeah, listen to that. Uh, now, dig this. Paul says, "I'm listening right now to episode 64, of Blues Part One." Mm-hmm. As I make my way through the series, you mentioned Amazing Grace as an old African-American spiritual. Mm -hmm. I can't remember if we actually mentioned that as a spiritual or if we just used it as an example. We I don't remember either. We started playing that. But anyways, um, the words, of course, were written by John Newton in England. But That's as, true. But as far as I have been able to gather, it was set to its modern tune in the States. Mm -hmm. So the melody was, I guess, came about in the States. Sure. I haven't seen any evidence to suggest that the tune was created by African-American slaves, Though maybe you've seen some evidence I haven't. Can't say I have. It would not be very surprising to me if it was because it's in a pentatonic scale. Mm -hmm. It seems at least to have been eagerly adopted by African-American communities, and that's mm, for sure. That's for sure. And all the more powerful <clears throat> if it was written or enjoyed by African-Americans because the author John Newton was a former captain of a slave trading vessel Absolutely. before his conversion. Yes, indeed. Um, he may have had this particular sin in mind when he wrote A Wretch Like Me. Uh, well, yeah, he had something going on. And his African-American brothers and sisters joined in God's forgiveness towards him by adopting this hymn to setting it to the tune. Mm -hmm. Amazing. That's a good theory, is any, I think. That is. And I would love to do some more research, you know, in all that spare time I have. I would love to, <laughs> I would love to do some more research on the origins of both the lyrics and the music to Amazing Grace. There is more than one musical setting to those words. Uh -huh. you know, they're, they're, I mean, the one is, of course, you know, that everybody knows, right? Uh -huh. But but there are there are others, and there are there are versions, especially that that, that happen around here in the deep south where we are, that that uh, are you know almost improvised, really. Mm -hmm. And and um, so there there there's a lot to that. Um, there would be a lot to unpack there. I, I confess that I should probably research more before I say anything in any great definitiveness. I, I, I did know that it was written by an Englishman who had, who had uh, uh, converted, had a Christian conversion. And... But if he was on a slave ship, it's possible some of these people were singing um, just to make him feel back It could have gotten into his ears. Yeah, Can some, of, some of this. Yeah, some of the... Uh, the African American spirituals from the slave days could have, could have, you know, th that pentatonic sound, you know, could have, could have gotten into his ears for sure. That's one, that's one idea. Well, just to be safe, I went back to that episode and I took out the Amazing Grace part and was able to actually replace it. I played Sweet Low, Swing Low, Sweet Cherry, <laughs> so it's not even an issue anymore. But I did want to point out that um, same, same I, notes. I try to, re yeah, I try to research the hell out of these things, but some things. Like for example, Amazing Grace. I just thought I took for granted that it was a, a spiritual, you know. So yeah, you miss yeah. a thing or two from time to time. And the mark of a good academic is is to rather than you know uh, rather than uh, uh, speculate with authority, just say you know I should do some research for that. <laughs> so so for once, I'm going to try to be a good academic and say you know what I need. I would need to research that before I said you know s said a whole lot. But yeah, we say it often. Uh, it takes the village. The more of these episodes we do, probably will come across this thing. We Although, learn as much as we learn as much as you guys do. We yeah. really do. Um, oh, and uh, so so th thanks again, Paul. Uh, Paul yes. is a lawyer. We have a lawyer now, Matt. We have a lawyer. We Excellent. have a lawyer on retainer. <laughs> uh, is that cool with you, Paul? <laughs> He says he gave Paul me, is going to write back with some, with some definitions of the word retainer and how he is not on it. It's going to be a long, long email. <laughs> <Yeah>. Lawyer speak. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> but no, seriously, he actually gave me some good some good um, insights on um, putting other people's music and stuff like that. The kind of stuff I always worry about. So right, he, right, he some yeah. Good, info on that. good, good plan. Good. So super cool, man. Yeah. And as far as keeping us in check, we have another we, another friend of ours, Nancy Mitchell, caught one of my silly mistakes. Um, from like episode nine again, a long time ago. Was that the website one? It was the website yeah. one. Uh, a different website thing though. That was. Oh. This is not Kate Hall. This is. Oh, Nancy yet Mitchell. another website mistake. But I spelled. Um, we're talking about alternate chords or something like that uh-huh. and their rolls. Uh huh. But I spelled it R O L L S, <laughs> like bread roll, sushi <laughs> roll. She's like, and that's the kind of thing spell check is not gonna. I'll see my little. Because it's a word, right? Yeah, it's yeah, a word. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. If I'm just skimming over it, I might miss that stupid. And not only is spell check not going to catch it, my brain often will not catch things like that. Just fly right over it. Yeah, I had when I was doing my dissertation, I had read through my dissertation so many times that there were glaring mistakes that I was just reading over over and over again, you know, Mm. because I had just read over it so many times, and Mm. it, it took somebody else saying, you know. Saying what you call a natural minor scale is not a natural minor scale. Uh-oh. <laughs> I was like, oh, oof, oof, ouch. <laughs> I learned that on day one. How did I miss that? Yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, Nancy, where other people might have just let it slide or been like maybe afraid to bring it up because they don't want to sound like a grammar Nazi or <laughs> whatever the political. Oh, grammar Nazi, yes. We're okay. Yeah, yeah. We're, yeah. We, we, we appreciate the correction. Because people could have just been reading that like, this guy just doesn't know how to spell, but I'll, <laughs> I'll take his theory. Right. <laughs> A little bit of both. I don't know. Anyway, right. thank you so much for that, and continue to let us know if you find little things like that that can help us make add more validity to our show. Right. And- <laughs> make us sound a little smarter than we otherwise would sound. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's funny that uh, that Paul mentions Amazing Grace and things and Blues Part One because this episode we're going to continue our discussion a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, of the blues. Correct. In part one of this series, we cover the history of the blues up to about the 1920s and discuss how African-American women such as Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, Mm -hmm. Ethel Waters, Mm -hmm. Mamie Smith, Ida Cox, Alberta Hunter. Big Mama Thornton. Oh, yeah. Sister Rosetta Tharp. We could go on and on with. Well, they all made the most impact through the first wave of the blues music that lasted Mm -hmm. up until about World War II. Right. Which began in 1939. Right. They sold the most albums and sold, sold out the biggest venues. However, a majority of them played with backup bands or accompanists. Mm. Um, when it comes to the instrumental performance of the blues music, there are a good number of male artists um, who are sculpting this sultry backdrop in different parts of the Deep South. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. How's that for good writing, Matt? <laughs> I don't fancy myself a writer, really, but you know, come on. Um, anyways, we'll be talking more about these cats in this episode. So, um, you know, we've got Ma Rainey, the mother of the blues, saying that mm. she's First heard this kind of music at a tent show in Missouri. Mm-hmm. We got W.C. Handy, father of the blues, saying he's first heard this at a train station in Tutwiler, Mississippi. And what strikes me about this is they first heard it in these places. So it was a it was a musical art form that was already extant uh, before it, it, it was start. It was taken up by people who would sort of become very successful or or become recording artists or or, or what have you, right? Yeah, no one's really claimed to have invented this. They've just claimed, man, I sure. heard this from rural place, and I want to bring it to you guys, you know? Right, or yeah. Or it meant something to them, and they decided to emulate that, you know? Right, yeah. Um, now, others mentioned hearing about this genre emerging in New Orleans, you know, mm. as well as parts of Texas and the Carolinas. Right, yeah. So these next, this episode and the following episode, we're going we're gonna to be talking about the main genres of the early blues period. Right. What identifies them musically, mm-hmm. and three or four artists that contributed to their popularity. Excellent. Real quick, I want to give out some credits. Sure. Um, I've been kind of using this book called The Blues, um, A Very Short Introduction by Elijah Wald. Oh, he's somebody that, uh, yeah, I have heard that name in connection with the, with the blues. Yeah. He, he's uh, somebody who's a, who's a bit of an authority if, I, if, I'm, if he's the person I'm thinking of. So. Mm. Well, I'm just using that as kind of a guideline to kind of steer me in the right direction. Mm. And then I'm going through some other sources such as Encyclopedia Britannica, mm-hmm. Encyclopedia.com, mm-hmm. TheHistoryChannel.com, Biography.com, a new one, Folkways.si.edu, and AllAboutBluesMusic.com. And if you're ever interested in any of these sources that, that um, we're using, we have links to those things on our website, correct? Oh, and we have a website, yes. And we have a website, <laughs> which we've been told we don't mention often enough. MusicStudent101.com. 
go yep. to podcasts and go to episodes. I think it is. And, yep, uh, yep, yep. You can learn. You can see graphics and and you know, notes, source aids, links and links. A- visual aids and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Huh. So, um, the first of these genres, and I guess really kind of where the where it all came from, really, mm. is is known as the country blues. Right. So this is one of the oldest styles of the blues that we know about. Mm-hmm. Uh, it dates as far back as the early 1900s, uh, at least the style does. The, the term country blues dates back to about the 1940s. You know, it's uh, attributed to this uh, guy named Alan Lomax, who is uh, a folklorist. So he was sort of researching uh, uh backwards and, and called this stuff that he had discovered country blues, right? Yeah. Alan Lomax was a, a folklorist, like a um, a song catcher, as, yeah. as one would call back in the right, day. Right, yeah. Kind of like Bella Bartok was in Europe oh. uh, just, a, just a few, a couple of decades before that, right? But uh, yeah, um, there's a lot of these kind of people walking, uh, going around the Americas uh, in, in the first half of the 20th century. And that's mm. why we know about a lot of stuff. That's why a lot of stuff didn't die. Yeah. Uh, this style, uh, the country blues style, was uh, sparse in its instrumentation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it often is just a guitar and a harmonica, or just a singer and a guitar. Um, I don't know if if Bessie Smith particularly would fall into this category or not, but no, not really. Yeah, because cause I know you know things like Mino Bedbug Blues and stuff. You yeah, Bessie Smith stuff. A lot of that is just singer and guitar. Well, well, actually the. The, the stuff she's singing about, like uh, bow weevils and bed bugs and yeah, things like that, yeah. very rural topics, you know. Right, yeah, pro- sure. Problems for the farmers, farming mm-hmm. community and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. But I know that her and Ma Rainey, once, by the time they were getting kind of big and people were hearing about them, they were playing with big, a company kind of okay. vaudeville-type jazz bands and stuff like that. Okay, yeah. Ma Rainey might, I don't know. She's listed as, I think just because of where they were in the period, they were kind of listed as country yeah. blues musicians. Yeah. Yeah, there's probably an interesting, I mean, we would we would have to be Alan Lomax to to, to know this for sure, but there's, I'm sure there's definitely an, an interesting sort of cross-section. I know I've heard Bessie Smith songs. It's just her singing with a guitar accompaniment. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so and, and like you say, she sings about sort of rural rural stuff a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm sure there's some crossover there, like maybe before she gets big or something, or she's hearkening back, one of those people who discover this style and then is making it popular or something, and then in the course of that, uh, making it popular, more instrumentalists get added or something. Mm-hmm. This. By the time anyway. you can afford more, to hire more bandmates. That's the way it works. <laughs> That's the way it works. Yeah. You know, that's why Guns N' Roses hired a keyboardist. <laughs> <laughs> And a conductor. <laughs> <laughs> a conductor, yeah. Um, and yeah, Metallica hired the flipping uh, San Francisco Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> mm-hmm. Anyway, anyway, <clears throat> back, back on topic. Um, so, yeah, this is music that is usually just a singer and a guitar player. Or just, a, or just really so often the same person playing guitar and singing or playing guitar and harmonica mm-hmm. singing. Uh, small stuff. Uh, but because the instrumentation was small, mm-hmm. it spread all around the South, which was sort of the region of its origin, right? Is that because they could travel better, easier, yes. cheaper, lighter? Yeah. yeah, just bring your guitar with you and, and, and sing, come around. You know, you didn't have to, you know, um, you didn't have to carry a band around. You know, you didn't you didn't have to have four or five people traveling. You know, which, you know, I mean, compared to jazz, even New Orleans jazz or, or Dixieland jazz would have three or four people, mm-hmm. right? This was often ju- just just one person just, just moving around. So it's it spread. If you time it just right, you could throw your guitar up on the boxcar and hop in there and get it <laughs> exactly. travel for free. Exactly, yeah. Um, so it, it spread all around the South. And this music captured, is said to have captured the African-American experience of the Deep South in in that time period. Now, so what is the African-American experience of the Deep South in this time period? Uh, hardships mm-hmm. of oppression, uh, hardships of employment. Uh, the, there were two ways work could give you the blues. Either your, your work was <laughs> manual labor and back-breaking mm-hmm. and... Uh, uh, 
degrading and miserable, uh-huh. or you couldn't find any. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, those were there. There were you know, uh, uh, two ways there where, where work was was, uh, was problems. The people yeah. in this ethnicity were probably not getting a lot of fair treatment when they first started getting employed. Yeah, you know, um, I teach a I, I teach a music of the world's people class in which we we take a chapter and we cover sort of the African American musical uh, uber genre, and in that we talk about a, a, a lot of blues and how even after emancipation, many a- African Americans were still doing jobs that basically were were very manual and ma- very backbreaking. Mm-hmm. You know, they had a big part. In um, they continue to have a big part in southern agriculture, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, then they continued also to have jobs like they played a big part in in the the uh, railroad expansion out west, laying the railroad tracks, for right? The big rail, you know, uh, uh, hammering rail spikes into you know, and a lot of the music we think of as traditionally African American music is, is is music that begins on the plantation, but but continues after slavery is over, you know, because the, the social conditions haven't changed. And so and and so country blues is a little bit the 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 same sort of thing in which we still have these social conditions where um you know uh we have a, a group of people living in in poverty, dealing with a lot of poverty, uh doing menial or degrading or difficult work when they are doing work mm-hmm. you know um depression is a, is a problem you know which means alcoholism is a problem yes you know which means difficulties in relationships are a problem and, and <laughs> these are all the things the blues sing about good chain of right? events there matt that's pretty yeah. damn pretty accurate yes almost like this is not the first time i've i've done i've gone over this <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it's uh, yeah, so so all of this stuff is is kind of a problem, and and the blues are a way of addressing this, right? Of a way of you know, I I tell my world music students the blues is a feeling as much as it is a musical genre. Yeah, you know, a musical genre has you know musical characteristics, chord progressions that that are typical to it, rhythms or meters that are typical to it song structures that are typical to it. And and the blues is a musical genre, but it's also a, a sort of a feeling, right? It, it, it's a particular way of choosing to deal with the most difficult hardships of life. Mm-hmm. You know? And, you know, and a lot of this do, you know, has originated in this region where we sit right now and, mm-hmm. and, and came out of this, this group of people that were, that were facing these, these very difficult times and lives. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, some artists even uh, continue to include uh, things from their forefathers in their blues music. Things like the old field hollers. Yeah, you know, and a, a field holler is is uh, you know both an idea and a genre too. But yeah, you know, field hollers could range from a single a single person working in the field. Uh, singing spontaneous improvised lyrics, you passing know, the time pa- to pass the time to you know the big what most people probably think of is is African American spirituals where there's a call and response you know and, and a person calls and the the, the rest of the group responds and, and and things like that and all of this becomes a part of blues you know when we talk about twelve bar blues uh, we divide twelve bar blues into three phrases. And each phrase has two measures of singing and two measures of fill. So there's a vocal call and an instrumental response. Right. And yeah. So, so they continue to 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 use those things. It, it is definitely a, a um, evolution from you know the the music that was going on during slavery. Some would even say it, some would some people even like to trace it all the way back to to African. Music, sure, with the banjo and uh, yeah, pentatonic well, scale and polyrhythms and and, and and all of that stuff. Yeah, uh, trace it all over back to the African continent and, and the kind of traditional musics there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but it definitely uh, is taking this stuff and, and and moving it forward to sort of evolve it and adapt it to to more current times. And those those work songs, those labor songs, they eventually evolve into. Blues as we as we know it today. Yeah, let's um. So let's talk about some of these country blues musicians, shall we? Let's do. Okay, like I said, the period we've been talking to kind of got us up into the twenties. You know, mm-hmm. 
Uh, we talked about the race records and how they kind of lasted, that, that kind of era lasted up until the 40s. Right. But let's go back. Um, in 1923, there was an Atlanta native who moved to, moved to New York to work with OK Records. Mm. We talked about them in the last episode. This is a white record label mm. who um, were going out and finding these black artists. Right. Um, they sent him back to find some good music from, um, from, uh, from back home. Uh-huh. And so uh, this was from New York going back to Atlanta. And he went there and he found a guy named Fiddling John Carson. And in the midst of recording some other blues artists, he found a guy named Fiddling John Carson. Mm -hmm. Who recorded this song called Little Old Log Cabin in the Lane. (laughs) Uh, This is one of the first known rural recordings. Right, yeah. So this was an old minstrel song. And Fiddling John Carson was a white guy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, what's the point is that the point is that, um, this would kind of open up the gate for all these other rural. When people thought at first the only reason people would listen to these rural artists was because they couldn't afford to go anywhere or hear anything but greater. Right, yeah. People started going crazy after this recording and were like, wait a minute. People all around love this stuff. Yeah, that's that's not the case. Uh, you know, it is the the records are very successful. Mm-hmm. Uh, particularly successful among white audiences. Yeah. You know. Now, this was incidentally known as the first country, by, considered by many to be the first country music recording. Really? Isn't that interesting? Interesting, yes. Not super surprising. No, no. Racially, how cool is he? Not terribly. <laughs> it turns out he had some, some uh, yeah. He had some issues. Like many of the minstrel white people performing yeah. minstrel songs, not all of them were doing it for that uh, specific noble goal of sharing the culture with others. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an original. There's actually a video footage of this being performed by a, a, a black musician, sure, named Uncle John Scruggs, sure. But it's the coolest video. It's film. It's like way black and white, grainy as hell. You can hear the music. It starts off this. His wife is feeding the chickens and turkeys, <laughs> and he pops out of the door and sits down with his guitar and he's like, "Come on, kids!" And he starts playing, and the kids all. Start boogieing down while he's playing. That sounds great. And he sings the song. The song is, I think it's about like it's a, I think it's a song about um, like an old slave who's passing away and he's kind of just living out his last days in this right. old cabin, kind of talking yeah. about that kind of stuff. But anyway, the whole point of that being that this brought the concept of rural music to the um, to the fore, foreground. Sure. To the sure. Now this same year. Um, OK Records also released Longing for Daddy Blues and I've Got to Leave My Daddy Behind. Mm. Should I have read that in reverse order? <laughs> hey. um, it featured the down-home sound of Sarah Martin and Sylvester Weaver. Uh-huh. Sarah Martin, a.k.a. the famous Moaning Mama, uh-huh, or uh-huh. the colored Sophie Tucker. Right. That's the word they used back then. Yep, yep. Sophie Tucker was a white um, vaudeville artist. Right, right, right yeah. So Sarah Martin came from the African-American vaudeville tradition. Mm -hmm. She was one of the most recorded female singers of the country blues genre. Wow. She recorded and toured with Fats Waller, King (laughs) Oliver, and other great musicians. And uh, hers was the first known recording of Taint Nobody's Business If I Do. (laughs) Are you familiar with that one? I am. Actually, I am. That's a good song. She recorded that with Fats Waller playing accompaniment. Nice. I think that was piano he was playing. And now Sylvester Weaver, her accompanist, was a pioneer of the country blues music style. Mm -hmm. Uh, During that same run with OK Records, he did some solo work for what they called the first blues guitar album. Mm -hmm. Based on the picture I saw, it was labeled Blues Guitar. Right. (laughs) Hey. You know what you're getting. Uh, If it's the first one, you can name it as simply as you want to. Uh, This was one of the first known recordings of that slide style. Now, I'm not sure what he was using. Um, they, They... we they used all kinds of things. We heard yeah. knives. Yeah. We heard bottle, bottlenecks. Bottlenecks. And, yeah. If there was a slide, I don't know what it would have been made from back then or how Who it would knows? have been made. Um, the guitar rag is the B-side of that album. Okay. Um, so in the guitar style, we're going to talk about when we get to the Piedmont blues mm-hmm. in the next episode. But long story short, the ragtime style is kind of like bass lines with your thumb. Right. Picking chords and melodies with the other fingers. So it's kind of like ragtime on the piano where the, where the left hand is playing a bass part that is solid where the right hand improvises a lot. And... Exactly. And many people have referenced that to the, mm. the piano sounding guitar. Mm-hmm. 
Um, he played this piece, however, this guitar rag piece, he played on a git Joe, which is a six-string banjo. Fun. How cool is that? Okay. So there's Sylvester Weaver and, uh, and Sarah Martin. A year later, Paramount released Airy Man's Blues and Papa, Papa's Laudy Laudy Blues by Papa Charlie Jackson from New Orleans. You heard of him, huh? I don't know that I've heard of him. There's so many papas and, and, and right, yeah. daddies uh-huh. and um, blind people. Like I said, there are so many blind people <laughs> we're going to talk about in the blues <laughs> world here. Seems like back then, if you're blind and your name was William or Bill, <laughs> you become a blues artist. Then you become blind Billy whatever, yeah. and, and they give you a guitar. and yeah. <laughs> But back to uh, Papa, Papa Charlie here. Uh, William Henry Jackson was born 1887. And he also got his start in the minstrel medicine show scene. And he sang the blues along with his own accompaniment of banjo, guitar, gitcho, or ukulele. Mm. So this is that rural music sound we're talking about. Sure. Now I thought it's interesting that he had the ukulele. Yeah. I said ukulele, but I guess it's uk- what ukulele. People say it differently, but whatever. Yeah. The uke. Because that is a Hawaiian instrument. Sure. Yeah. And it was funny that W.C. Handy was talking about in the train station he likened that slide guitar sound to a Hawaiian sound. Yeah, yeah, I can, I, I can see that, I suppose. So, if you'd never heard it before, I'm not saying the blues came out of Hawaii. <laughs> no, no, probably not. But it sure is interesting, right? Yeah. So, in April of '24, um, Papa Charlie's release of "Salty Dog Blues" became his most famous song. Mm. The record label claimed him to be the only male who could sing the blues better than a woman. <laughs> Opinion? Marketing ploy? <laughs> I don't know. A little of both. It's just a matter of opinion, some say. Um, He also accompanied many of the great blues queens, such as Ma Rainey, Ida Mm. Cox, and Hattie McDaniel. Mm -hmm. This was all around the beginning of the race records era we talked about. Sure. He was also a pioneer of what became known as the hokum genre. Are you familiar with this? (laughs) No. You've heard it. This is really crass. This is really crass music. They would refer to anatomical parts. Okay. But they would use clever rhymes and clever uh, double on, uh, you know. Yeah, I don't think I knew there was a name for that. Yeah. And it was Hokum, and they were doing it really early. Wow. And actually, towards the end of that Bessie Smith movie, it turns out she was kind of getting into that music when John oh. Hammond found her. It was like, right. let's yeah. come back to, to the other stuff. You know? uh-huh. um, she's like, that's my thing now. <laughs> people love it. People laugh at it. But anyway, that's the Hokum style. Um, we'll talk about that later on, too. Um. <laughs> so he had a great little number called Shake That Thing. You've heard that one? It's a, uh, they call it Shake That Thing, all Shake yes. That Thing. Yes, I have heard that. I'm getting sick and tired of telling you to shake that thing. <laughs> I love sick and tired. I am getting sick and tired. I'm getting sick and tired of telling you to shake that thing. Yeah. <laughs> so here's a fun little pop culture note. Um, Sanford and Son episode, The Blind Mellow Jelly Collection. Not familiar. <laughs> Neither was I, but I, w- I went back and scrubbed through it a little bit, you know. Uh, Apparently there's a scene where Sanford's getting down to this music. Yeah, yeah. But it's, um, but the, but the, but the record is, the, the artist is a fictional, I guess, Blind Mellow Jelly that they came up with. <laughs> Sanford, Lamont, his son, wants to get rid of all these junky records. Sanford's yeah. like, oh man, that's history. That's, uh, you don't know your history. That's Blind Mellow Jelly. Blind Melly Com- Jelly. Comedy ensues. They they take it to the um, they're gonna donate it because they can't. They don't think they can sell it. Sure. And the guy's like, "That's a five hundred dollar value." <laughs> so he's got to find a way to get these records back. <laughs> but check it out. That was a fun little episode. The parts okay. that I saw. If you want to hear, shake that thing and see Red Fox grooving down to it. Uh, now, finally, from the country blues genre, we have Lonnie Johnson. Lonnie Johnson was born in. 1899 in New Orleans. He had a very musical family. Mm. As a kid, he played fiddle in his dad's string band and also excelled in mandolin, banjo, and piano. Mm. Now, when he was in his late teens, he joined a music review that traveled to England and played around there for a couple of years. Yeah. It was 1917. Two years later, when he returned in 1919, he learned that both of his parents and all of his siblings, except for one, passed away to the influenza epidemic of 1918. Yeah, I've, I've heard of that. I hear about it a lot nowadays. You talk about life, hardships of life inspiring this, some of this music. Mm. Good Lord. He and his brother James, the remaining brother, the remaining sibling, moved to St. Louis 
where they played in, in a duo, and they would play riverboats and other venues. He would also play with his um, bigger jazz bands. Right. In 1925, again, OK Records sent some representatives to St. Louis to organize a talent contest. The winner of this contest would get a record deal. And that was Lonnie Johnson. Wow. Over the next seven years, Lonnie would perform with over, on over 130 tracks and tour and record with the likes of Bessie Smith, Victoria Spivey, and Louis Armstrong. His style was polished and virtuosic. While polished and virtuosic. Yes, polished and virtuosic. What does that mean? It means exactly. that he had, compared to some of these other guys, he had a very formal and a very a- interactive musical training from an early age mm-hmm. with multi instruments, and it sounds like with mul- I mean, with really, really good education from his. Okay, I so mean, he, so uh, um, sort of a. a, a uh, informed musical style where he had more uh, education and more more of a skill set. Yes, more of a skill set, I would say, mm. as a guitarist and right, yeah. all the other instruments he played. Sure. Which sometimes knowing another instrument can inform how you act on another instrument. Yeah, I just I always wonder what the word polished means whenever I hear it in context with music. Polished. Dude. If I, if Does someone... it means the strings were shinier? You know, probably... <laughs> Doubt it. I, I doubt it. Uh, it. They may be referring to more metrically confined, right? No, maybe so. It, it, especially if he had had more education in what meter was, and and was expressing that by by being more thoughtful of his meter. You know, then that might come out as quote unquote polished. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Or maybe his technique was just solid. Maybe it was just good. Solid. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it just sounded polished. I don't know. Yeah. But uh. Let's see here. He was recording, um, when he was recording the Savoy Blues with Louis Armstrong, he busted out what may be the first recorded guitar solo. His one string soloing technique would later influence T Bone Walker, mm-hmm. Django Reinhardt, and basically all guitarists who ever took a solo. Yeah, so this is happening in New Orleans. Yep. Uh, and so he catches the attention of uh, I, jazz pioneer Louis Armstrong. No, I take it back. He, he was in New Orleans, he moved to St. Louis. Okay. Um, but I don't know if, where he met Armstrong. Well, but, Armstrong was famous or, at, at some point here, and he's probably is traveling all over the place. So, yeah, like I said, a lot of the country people travel and play with yeah. each other. Yeah, you see sure. A lot of them playing with Bessie Smith and oh, absolutely. Yeah. All these just, other people. You think I normally think New Orleans jazz when I think Louis Armstrong. So it, it's interesting the cross section of jazz and blues that happens here. Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. Well, many of these artists um, from the country blues style came from different regions, you know. Mm-hmm. Among them, we will be discussing Charlie Patton, Blind Lemon Jefferson, Blind Willie McTell. But these are all people that from different that are actually more known to be from Texas style Delta blues and so sure. forth and so on. Mm-hmm. Speaking of the Delta blues, speaking of the Delta blues, the uh, the other genre we're going to cover with the time we have today, right? So, what are the Delta blues? Well, first of all. The Mississippi Delta region goes from about, you know, it's, it, it is considered from northwest Mississippi uh, to uh, what we call the, the Vicksburg area, which is sort of mid-southwest Mississippi, mm-hmm. right? Um, if you recall, uh, in, in the first episode, we talked about W.C. Handy and how he first heard uh, a man playing guitar with a knife at a train station in Mississippi, in Tutwiler, Mississippi, in, in 1903. This is in the northwest region of Mississippi. Mm-hmm. Tutwiler? Yes. M- and music from this region is characterized by what we now think of as a slide guitar sound. Mm-hmm. Uh, did it originate there? Is it? Yeah, uh, uh, why did it originate there? Those... Those are questions for people who know more about this than me, but but it might not ever. No one might actually know that because it, it may ma- be hard to to pinpoint. Nineteen oh two or whatever this was, nineteen oh four. This was mm-hmm. an unknown man. Yeah, like you said, that's he t- was just a man. The person Ma Rainey saw, the tent show person. Just, yeah, just yeah. A person. It, it was so, so clearly this music is existing before these people who later become successful recording artists. You know, and 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 it is discovered. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, you know they would like we were saying they would use all kinds of things knives bottlenecks um, pieces of metal you know it did, almost anything that could hold down all the strings would would uh, become a, a an effective slide mm-hmm. uh, this is also where an unmistakable call and response sound comes from right? and this is something that 
You know, it's always funny to me, um, the whole call and response thing. You know, I mean, I can find examples of call and response in Chinese folk music. So there, mm-hmm. there's something, it seems like there's something primordial. There's something just sort of basic to, to, to the way humans decide to structure their music that, that call and response comes out of. So it's always, there's always a little bit of a question mark for me of, you know, because something is call and response, you know, should we necessarily go, oh, well, let's call and response, and they got the call and response from the, yeah. the labor music, you know, or from the country blues who got it from the labor music. Is yeah, There's always that little bit of a question mark. Is there really an ancestral lineage here, or or is or is there just something kind of fundamental about about call and response, you know, in terms of the, just the ways human beings you know, uh, structure music. I mean, we could call sonata form a type of call and response if we if we squinted hard enough at it. Yeah. Know? And we'll talk about sonata form in some upcoming podcast, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. At some point? <laughs> at some point. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there you go. You know... Th- uh, in, in this case, I, it, 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 there's probably a, a good plausible reason to believe that the call, the call and response was something in, in this culture. But back to what you're saying, we talked about how even in ancient music, Music mm-hmm. has always been kind of a communal thing. Sure. So call and response. You've got more than one people making music. Yeah. Maybe that's just came up. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the way uh, the the way organum worked in in 11th century France. You know, I mean, you could, like I said, we don't call it call and response, but if you squinted at it hard enough, <laughs> you know, I mean, you could sort of call it call and response, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway. So the, how this would work, and we alluded to this previously, but how this would work is the singer would sing a line uh, over the first two measures, mm-hmm. you know, and would play a lick. Usually, and and by a lick we mean we're not just strumming chords. We're going to play a, a soulful thing, a melodic sounding thing, mm-hmm. a little kind of mini two measure melody here. That is the response to our call. It usually sounds like it could be sung, yeah. right? If, yeah. if you just put lyrics to it and sang it rather than played it on your guitar. It's, it's, it's a melody-like uh, thing, and that is a, a lick. They would uh, bend it and to do other things to make it sound more like a... Right. ...of sing a song. Right, part, yeah, kind of. yeah. Um, melodies that sound like speech, that are like the spoken word, is, is a characteristic of a lot of African-American music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, 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 this one included. Uh, over the following two measures, so this this little lick uh, mo- uh, is two measures long. So we have two measures of singing, and then we have two measures of the instrumental fill, the lick, uh-huh. right? And that's phrase one, our first four measures. Yes. Phrase two is the same thing, two measures of singing, and then two measures of a lick. So we have our next four measures, so we're eight measures in. So we go to four, right? But we go to the subdominant chord. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we go to four, meaning the the subdominant chord. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and then we have our third phrase, which is two measures of singing, played over the dominant chord. Yes. Right. Wait. No. Yeah, one measure played over the dominant chord. Yeah, and then one measure played over the subdominant chord. Mm-hmm. And then two measures of fill on the tonic. Yes. Right. And this is the basic. Twelve bar blues pattern. Yeah. So this is this is the music. So you know we got four, uh, uh, three measures of four bars each. Three times four is twelve. Mm-hmm. You know we uh, we have we have twelve bars, twelve measures, and that's the twelve bar blues. Over this uh, musical pattern is an A A B lyrical pattern, mm-hmm. in which a thought is stated A. You know in the first two measures, mm-hmm. play the lick. Go to the dominant subdominant chord. Mm-hmm. Uh, repeat that over the subdominant. Yeah. Right. Play the lick. Right. And then go to that fr- that that final phrase, which is five four one dominant subdominant, one, and complete the thought in a clever way, in a uh, poetic way, you know, or in a meaningful way. Or in the case so, of hokum, in a dirty way. Or in a dirty way. Yeah. <laughs> or in a way uh, rife with double entendre. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so um. So yeah, that's that's the 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 basic idea, and it comes out of this sort of uh, uh, delta delta blues kind of stuff. But you can also see this pattern in country blues and in, in blues even in Chicago and, and in things like that. So who knows where it came from, really? 
We're going to find out later on that uh, some of these cats ended up moving to Chicago to yeah to, to, to make that happen. Could very well have taken it there. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so this style is big through the 1920s, uh, all the way through the Great Depression. Imagine, uh, imagine a style of blues becoming pro popular during the Great Depression. Imagine. Right, yeah. Um, despite, uh, you know, there is the, there's a big decre decrease during the 30s, during the Depression, in music recordings, because people just didn't have the kind of money to spend on that thing. Food, yeah. music. Yeah, yeah. People just didn't have the kind Food. of money to spend on on buying records, you know. Uh, and and people didn't have the kind of money to invest in renting studios or anything like that either. So, so uh, there were there were a decrease in music recordings, but there were the the blues recordings that were out there were ever more popular, mm -hmm. right? Ever ever more popular. Um, so you know, and a lot of a lot of genres of blues. I, I hate to say they fizzled, really. They or, or they, you know, they they didn't they, they didn't come out of World War II as popular as they were before the World Wars. They had right? a decrease in popularity. Right. Yeah. Uh, Delta Blues did not. Yeah. Delta Blues kind of increased in popularity, um, and this paved the way for what would <clears throat> what would uh, ultimately eventually come to be known as Chicago Blues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, D uh, Detroit and uh, the the electric uh, versions of uh, of blues, mm -hmm. which would pave the way for for modern blues. You know, and, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Because because blues is a living musical genre. It, it still it still lives. Oh, it's alive and well, man. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, do you want to talk about some of these artists? Yes, let's talk about some art artists. So I, I guess the best place to start would be Charlie Patton. This is the father of the Delta Blues. The father of the Delta Blues. He was born circa 1891 in Hines County, Mississippi, mm. which is near Jackson, the right. Jackson, Mississippi area. Been there. Yeah, it's actually a pretty cool little little town, Jackson. Mm. This man was uh, something to behold. Okay, <laughs> first off, he was married eight times, <laughs> and he spent some time in jail with one of these lucky ladies after a bit of a brawl they had together. Uh, he was also kicked off the Dockery Plantation three times. <laughs> now, let's talk about this Dockery Plantation, because I kept on seeing this over and over again as I went from musician to musician. Mm. Apparently, the Dockery Plantation was about a 104-square-kilometer cotton plantation and sawmill that would house its workers and provide local schooling, churches, postal service, and general stores. Wow. It kind of reminds me of some of these little communities that are popping up, like... We had this place called Liberty Park, which is a very wealthy community, mm -hmm. and all in the same, you know, ten block area. They have the dentist, the doctor. Right. It's yeah. like they could just stay there and never leave. Well, their it bubble. reminds me of some of the rural communities uh, centered around factories, you know, um, centered around mill factories and things like that, that that popped up throughout the 20th century, where where everybody in the town worked for the for the for the mill, and the you know the mill owned. I'm actually speaking a little bit of my hometown here, but but the mill owned the houses, and so you rented your house from the mill who was paying your salary. So the money just went right back to and 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 uh, stuff like that. Kind of reminds me of that a little. That's what was going on. It was the weird... company store, you know that kind of. Yeah, it was a weird little thing. They actually had, they had their own currency. Mm -hmm. They would pay mm -hmm. these yeah, people the company store, yeah, and their own currency, and then they would go to the dentist with this currency mm -hmm. and use it. So yeah, mm -hmm. they're kind of yeah. just all within this little community. Yep. Commune almost. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, but this particular plantation, and <clears throat> again, I say plantation, this is the, this is man, the people are emancipated. These people are coming here to work, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, they were known for their fair treatment of these workers and their sharecroppers, and thus attracted many laborers of all ethnicities. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these were from Mexico, Matt. I don't doubt it. And they brought guitars. Wow. So we have some Spanish influence or, or some Hispanic influence yes. rather into the, yeah. Uh, well, I'm speculating. Yeah. But I understand that the Mexicans did bring the guitars to this place yeah. where all these blues people started or like Charlie Patton yeah, yeah. started working at, mm. you know? So anyways, Charlie Patton was a, he was a performer, you know, he was, he would play his guitar between his legs and around his back. <laughs> Sound familiar? Sure. Oh yeah. Thinking Chuck Berry, maybe <laughs> he would jump around on stage. Yep. So, um, and this heavy smoking and drinking could be heard in his voice. This was just a wild man. He actually played with W.C. Handy and turned down the gig to play in his band. Mm. 
what I was reading kind of led me to believe this guy was kind of difficult to work with, possibly. <laughs> possibly. Uh, in 1929, Paramount released his big hit, Pony Blues. Mm. Between that time and 1934, he recorded 70 songs. Mm. Wow, his, that's a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In that small time period. Um, his stage antics and playing style would heavily influence others like Howlin' Wolf, Sun House, and Buka White. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, there's the father of the Delta Blues, Charlie Patton. And I think it's just really interesting how there's this little place where all these people ended up meeting yeah. as a community. So they play music together sure. after the uh-huh. day, you know, and it's just, just a pretty amazing thing. This brings us to Robert Johnson. Uh, Robert everyone, Johnson. Most people are familiar with this name. Mm, indeed. Um, he was born in 1911 in Hazelhurst, Mississippi, near Jackson. Mm-hmm. At age eight, he moved to the Tunica area to live with his mom. And in his teens, he would return to Clarksdale to live with his dad. Mm. Now, Clarksdale is also a well-known city where a lot of these um, Delta Blues musicians right. came from. Yeah. Mm. Okay. He was already learning guitar and harmonica when he met Willie Brown. And Willie Brown was a guitarist with Charlie Patton, who we just talked about. Right. Brown took Robert Johnson to the Dockery Plantation where Patton lived, mm-hmm. where he met Patton. Yep. And where he was given his first guitar. So his first guitar came to this plantation. Um, this is where Robert also met Tommy Johnson, who inspired him with his intense guitar style and high voice. Uh huh. He also played with Sun House, who taught him the slide guitar technique. So by, by the time he was done with these guys at the Dockery place, his technique had gotten quite, you know, quite well developed. Yeah. And, um, a product of a musical community at mm. that point. Yeah. And all music really is communal in, in the end of the day. I think so. Yeah. Um, if a note rings in the woods and no one's there to hear it, <laughs> it doesn't make a sound. <laughs> um, his style involved complex chords, alternate tunings, and slide techniques, and walking bass lines with a thumb. Complex chords. How complex? Well, that's a good question. Well, I think that by the fact he's using alternate tunings... Um, might contribute to that. Yeah. Alternate tunings are a thing with slide guitar, too. Yes, yes, yes. You know, open G and what have you. And if, if I'm thinking complex chords in the blues genre, I'm probably thinking, like, just seventh chords. Maybe. Maybe yeah. the occasional um, suspension or something like that. Yeah, maybe occasional think? nine or eleven chord or something. Maybe, I don't know. Because by then, those, those chord tones had made their way into music. Sure. One way or the other. Oh, sure. Yeah, they were in classical music a hundred years before this. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean that's that's like a very good question. I'm, I'm not quite sure, but mm. I know what a com- what I think a complex chord is. <laughs> I know what I think a complex chord is. Yeah, we talked about those on the last episode, yeah. didn't we? <laughs> Anyways, um, so consider the king of the Delta Blues. He wasn't really recorded a whole lot. Mm. In fact, Robert Johnson only participated in a couple of recording sessions in Texas. I heard about that. It's it's more his the songs is it's more the songs he wrote. Right? Than, than, than the actual recordings himself of him. Maybe so. Yeah, it's more the, the, the songs he wrote and, and the way he played. He was, he was really famous for just being really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? and, and word got around because of that. Yeah, and we'll talk about why some people thought that, right? Right. <laughs> um, but uh, anyways, these two recording sessions took place in 1936 and 1937. Mm-hmm. This is only the span of a year during which he... Recorded a total of 29 songs. Yeah. Including Traveling Riverside Blues and Crossroad Blues. Crossroad Blues. Now, that's an, that's an infamous uh, piece of music. Yeah, right? Let's talk about that, huh? <laughs> Let's talk about that. What do you know about the whole devil? What I know is that there's an old blues folk legend surrounding Robert Johnson. Mm-hmm. And this legend, and there are variations of it. There are different different versions, but... The the basic idea is that Robert Johnson is a poor, struggling blues player who is not especially good, mm-hmm. quite mediocre, in fact, having a hard time getting gigs, getting places to play, because he's just not that great compared to, you know. And he goes to meet the devil at a place where two roads cross. Mm-hmm. And in southern folklore, a place where two roads cross is is a is a is a powerful f- 
Southern folklore symbol anyway. Interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've oh, heard yeah. it all the time. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never thought so, about it. So he goes, it shows up in a lot of legends and stories and stuff. So he goes to these crossroads where these, where these two roads intersect, and he meets the devil. And in some versions, the devil gives him a magic guitar, and in some versions, the devil just teaches him how to play. But the, the big crux is he sells his soul to the devil in order to become a great blues player and then comes back from this experience as one as the greatest blues player there is. <laughs> now, um, now, where this folk legend originated, I have no idea. Mm-hmm. I know that I'm, or at least I, I feel pretty positive there are at least a few people in Robert Johnson's time and life that genuinely believed this story. You know? Right. Um, why, would, why, why would they believe that instead of maybe he said a prayer and, and, and saw God and God taught him how to play guitar? Why does it have to be the devil? <laughs> why is the devil such a good guitar player? Well, in many southern religious uh, in many southern religious practices blues was was definitely associated with unchristian things secular secular and yeah by by uh, being prof- secular. profane yeah it would have been believed by the the religious uh people and community of that time i do suspect that um the blues would have come from the devil, not from God. There's actually a pretty good uh, documentary on Robert Johnson mm-hmm. uh, out there too. It was on Netflix for a while. You could maybe look it up, but there's actually two of them, mm. and that's where we get most of what we know about Robert Johnson. <laughs> it's from this documentary. It's from these documentaries. <laughs> and the folklorist that they contacted. And the folklorist that they contacted <laughs> to get yeah. it done. But uh, one of these is the search for Robert Johnson in 1991 mm-hmm. by John Hammond Jr. Mm. John Hammond Sr. was um, a, just one of those guys that would go around searching for music. Mm, and yeah. um, He's kind of well-known. You get a degree in that, and they call you a musicologist. A musicologist. That's what we would call him, I, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and he said, uh, and the, the, the other one was, Can't You Hear the Wind How? The Life and Music of Robert Johnson. Mm-hmm. And that is by Peter Meyer and Gene Compton. So... If you want to learn more about Robert Johnson, maybe you should consider checking out those documentaries. Quite mm-hmm. a character. And if you want to learn more about Southern folklore, that's that's kind of a fascinating subject, it too. That's one of the co- m- most interesting stories to me, honestly. Oh, sure, yeah. Now, there was a guy that he was taking guitar from that apparently played in the graveyard all the time. Not because it was not to be evil, just because it was quiet, but it was a guy named Ike Zimmerman. I've always suspected the truth is he probably just went away and took lessons somewhere and came back and was much better. But that's not a good story, right? <laughs> well, I'm assuming that the time he spent at this Dockery plantation might have been, especially considering the musicians he was surrounding himself with, might have actually been a very prolific period of time. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? He yeah. Came back the, the, the whole underside of the, the circle of the hero's journey, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's Robert Johnson. Mm-hmm. So, so then Muddy Waters... Yeah, yeah, Muddy Waters, I think, is the last person we're going to talk about today. Okay. This is uh, three good heavy hitters from the Delta Blues region. Mm-hmm. Muddy Waters, named so by his siblings because he really loved to play in the creek, apparently, <laughs> out by the house that they lived at. I thought that was cute. He was born in uh, 1913, and he grew up in the Clarksdale area, as we discussed earlier. Right, yeah. Another hotbed for the Delta Blues. Mm-hmm. By age 17, he was playing guitar and harmonica in the style of Robert Johnson. Mm-hmm, right. So very much influenced by this man. In 1941, we talked about how Alan Lomax traveled to um, traveled around. And, sure, yeah. And that's where he, he found Muddy Waters, actually. Right, yeah. He was going to find Robert Johnson. Mm-hmm. Robert Johnson passed away several years before. Yeah. So, so he found Muddy Waters instead. Yes. And it was at this place called the Stovall Plantation. Which it sounds like it was very similar to the Dockery Plantation. Yeah, yeah. Communal place where people worked out like that. Yeah. While Alan Lomax is out there, he's going to record some field recordings for the Library mm-hmm. of Congress. Mm-hmm. And um, he, this is where he found McKinney Morganfield, mm-hmm. a.k.a. Muddy Waters. Mm-hmm. He returned to record another batch of songs not long after that and was able to uh, play back some of Muddy's previous recordings to him. Sure, yeah. Uh, and when Muddy heard this, he was hooked. He's like, I want to do music. He was inspired to make music his life. He traveled around the South and on to St. Louis and eventually to Chicago in uh, 1943. Right, yeah. 
Now, though Muddy would later be known as the father of Chicago blues, uh uh-huh, uh-huh, right, yeah, he had a passion for the Delta blues and wanted to record it. So he found himself opening for the likes of Big Bill Brunzi in the big and bigger and bigger venues. And uh, he's as soon as he heard about the electric guitar, he knew he had to have it because mm. they started playing these bigger rooms and with bigger bands. You need more sound. You need more sound. His his licks were getting swallowed up by the rest of the band, and in a big in a big venue, mm. you got reverb, echo, booming mm. around the room. A lot of things mm-hmm. happen mm-hmm. sonically that can easily. Can, people chattering, people having a good sure, time. Sure, absolutely. Can swallow that acoustic guitar right up. So, obviously, the electric guitar was a very new thing in this, right, in this yeah. time period. Yeah. You know? Um, but he's kind of the guy that ushered in that to the blues sound. Yeah. So, by 1946, he was recording with Columbia and Aristocrat Records. And some of his big hits are Hoochie Coochie Man, which I've heard of before, and I Just Want to Make Love to You. And everybody's then, heard that one. And then, baby, please don't go. Did I, I read think that? Everybody's heard that one too. Yeah, <laughs> Eat Muddy Waters is a big one. Sounds like he was a, li- a man for the ladies. <laughs> you think? And it sounds like these songs could all happen in the same order. Hoochie, I'm a hoochie coochie man. I just want to make love to you, baby. Please don't go. <laughs> what did I do? There's a there's a chronology to to, to the Muddy Waters. <laughs> so there you go. So that's just a little bit into the blues. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when we will we will come back to this topic at some point. Yeah. At some point, um, it might be another few episodes down the road. Yep. There's no sense in recapping this because we would just be reading the same. We stuff. Would just be. <laughs> okay, I will tell you what we can do. Um, what this episode has basically mainly been on was the country blues. Yes. Right. Yep. Um, and then we learned about kind of how it spread. How right. Fiddling John Carson, this country guy, bust yep. out this minstrel tune. People find out that. This thing exists and they love it. They eat it right. up. Yeah, it rec- is pre-extant before that. Right. Yes. Exactly. Other records send scouts all across the southeast to try and find other musicians and mm-hmm. artists. Yeah. And that's where a lot of these came from. And one of the big places they discover is the Mississippi Delta. The, the Mississippi Delta Delta Blues, which is famous for slide guitar and exactly uh, and then and response and yeah yeah exactly and then um, when we come back we're going to talk about these other styles the Piedmont Blues Chicago Blues. Texas blues mainly. I think we're gonna do mainly Piedmont and Texas. Okay. If we have room, we'll do t- Chicago and Detroit. Okay. Or if we have to, we'll just consider that part of the modern blues. Sure. And do that in its own episode. I okay. don't know, man. Because when I was doing research for this episode, we were supposed to talk about all of that. Yeah. No. But no, no, no. I get into the rabbit hole and it gets kind of crazy. <laughs> well, there's a lot there. There's a lot there, man. And there's a lot of stuff I don't want to leave out. But yeah. That's impossible. Yep. We are only two people. This is only a hour plus podcast. Right. Right. But we hope that you guys got some cool little stories out of that and some cool insights. Yeah, indeed. And we will be back with more stuff soon. We hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. There's still plenty more of this genre to talk about. So keep listening for part three. And try not to get the blues in the meantime questions or comments, email us at info at musicstudent101.com.